I'm Jamie S. Rich. I've been working in comics for 20 years. Join me as we dig a little deeper into how comic books are made and get to know the people who make them. This is From the Gutters. Basically, you get kind of sometimes pigeonholed into a superhero genre because of powers, but in general, like you've done a lot of different types of genres. You've done Mice Templar, you did Hammer of the Gods, which is more like Viking adventure with mythology, yeah, so yeah so. fantasy. Uh, what about the Rapture? Does that come from a personal place? Was that are you religious, or was that just like you thought it'd be a cool setting? Well, I thought that, like like the Rapture was a good sort of analogy for something, um, which was uh, talking about dating long distance. And your, your wife, Taki Sama, co yes. yes, Taki Sama's co-creator of um, Rapture and uh, co-writer. She helped do layouts on it, and she did alternative covers with me. And um, we had both been through, um, you know, big relationships that had, you know, fallen apart. For me, it was divorce, and Taki had other relationships and stuff. And, you know, we just started talking about how it feels like the end of the world. And, you know, it was very easy then to take, that was like this, it, it seems like both, for both Taki and our lives are, are constantly just thinking of ideas. And like everything we hear, everywhere you go, something will, will trigger an idea. So having that conversation was like, well, how a, you know, uh, at the end of a relationship feels like the end of the world. So we started with these two characters who are dating long distance and, um, and they, they basically break up and the end of the world actually happens. So Rapture wasn't a religious analogy, it was more an analogy about how it feels like when relationships fall apart. Um, and then we threw superheroes and fun stuff and apocalyptic things in there. Um, you know, listen to a lot of bright eyes and that kind of thing, it's awesome. Do you think really, <laughs> com- like long-term comic collaborations are a little bit like relationships as well? Oh my god, yeah, definitely. Because you've got yeah. two writers you've worked with a lot, Brian Jail Glass and Brian mm-hmm. Michael Bendis. Yeah, I only work with Brian. I say, you kind of guys named Brian. <laughs> Like, what keeps you going back to working with those as opposed to just sticking with doing your own thing? Well, obviously there's a talent there. That's sort of the foundation of that work relationship. But then it's it's a relationship that's bigger than just just you like this person and stuff. It's a real actual relationship like family. Um, it's, it's not quite the same as friendship when it's a creator thing. It's kind of hard to put your, your finger on. Like, Brian Glass and I just go back... So like when I was 17 or so, and you know, we were working at a comic book store in Philadelphia and doing role-playing games with, um, we're doing a Star Wars role-playing game with um, uh, Brian, Adam Hughes, and a couple of other friends. And a lot of creative ideas came out of that. And that's where Brian and I started working together. Um, so I know Brian's taste really well. He knows mine really well. We know how to work together in a way where um, I just kind of give him ingredients of the story and then um, he'll kind of you know, create a story and characters around that. He made the Mice Temple world way more in depth than I ever had it planned out. And I already had it planned out pretty in depth because it was a mythology based story and stuff, but he took it even further. Um, and then with, with Brian Bendis, we started out as sort of um, just our own professional basis and we trusted each other. And then a friendship grew out of that. Um, and we're as close as family now. But it's also, like I said, it's, it's difficult to, to explain those kind of relationships because. Um, we were talking about earlier, you used to be our editor on, on Powers. Um, and Brian and I, outside of Powers, are possibly the best people you can work with. We hit our deadlines. Um, if we don't make our deadlines, we're going to tell you ahead of time and stuff. And you know, I, I know I have a good reputation for that, so I know I do that well. Inside of that circle, it is, it's like a gang of two. It's me and Brian. We psychically, quietly talk to each other and don't communicate any of those thoughts to anybody else that we work with for some reason. I don't know why. There, there definitely was a brother element to it as well. It's like I'm wrangling two brothers who love each other, but there's like a rivalry and, and like, it's his fault, no, it's his fault. And like, <laughs> he's not doing it. And, and yeah. so it's keeping that balance. And because you guys would even kind of sometimes go at it mm-hmm. over like the smallest details. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was a there was a, like handful of fights that we had over something um, in comics, and both of them were, were kind of like sexually oriented. Uh, there was a shot of, um, there was a scene where, you know, a storyline where Satan was involved, and uh, Satan basically shows up to tell Walker to step back from a case. Um, it's much deeper than that, I swear, but uh, and Walker's just like, fuck you, man, you know, I'm do what I want and stuff, and I'm gonna, you know, do my job. And he basically threatens Walker with rape, 
and he turns into like all these characters from him and he holds Walker down and he throws 10 cocks and he starts jerking off on, on said Walker. Like, I'm going to face rape you, bitch, you know? <laughs> um, and when, when we colored it, we colored it really dark. Um, so you kind of not quite see what was happening. And I felt like, it, I don't want to say I felt like it was a weird sense of censorship, but because it was something that was so disgusting and, and that far out there and um, that really dark, I mean, you know, the, you know a rape threat is, is really dark, especially when you're a main character. So I felt like it needed to be seen really clearly. And it wasn't, and then Brian was like, you're crazy. And I'm like, no, you're crazy. Um, Cause I had drawn like 10 pages of like figuring out what 10 cocks look like yeah. and jerked off in one hand. It was a lot of work, man, you know? So yeah, I wanted it to be seen. That's fair. Um, so there was stuff like that. You that, gotta flag at the FBI or Google cachets. Yeah. Why is all these cops? Yeah. Um, so uh, that was one thing we fought over. And I forget what the other one, I think it was a masturbating scene, another masturbating scene that we, were, we had a thing about. Um, but it was never about censorship. It was just always about like how it was presented in the story, um, which sounds highfalutin for that kind of stuff. I know, it's true. It's, you always have to gauge like how are people gonna, are they gonna react to this the way I want them to react to it? Yeah, and just, you know, just as far as storytelling goes. Um, uh, yeah, that was, that was a thing. Um, throughout the history of Powers, I mean, Brian and I always had a thing of like, we have other projects going on and it's hard to keep you know, the, the, the one book going on and being dedicated to it while doing other stuff. And I definitely went through a growing spurt myself, figuring out what I needed to focus on. Um, and, and Powers wasn't always it when it should have been. So that was definitely like way, like in the early 2000s, that was a big, big issue for us. Like, I mean, staying focused on the book. So you guys are doing that for like 12, 13 years now? That's the other thing. You're doing a book for that long. Yes. Yeah. You know, there's not many books that have been, a creator owned books that have been around that long consistently. I know when we when we were working together, the sweet spot was forever. Uh, yeah. that, that was like the... It's still forever. Right ...that went off without a hitch. Like, we hit all the deadlines that came out. Yeah. And But also just the most unique, because that's the one where we started at the beginning of time. Yeah, and the most see, issue. See Walker go all the way through. I can't imagine what it was like reading the book at the time and having no warning that all of a sudden... You're gonna read an issue. It's just monkeys, you know, fighting and stuff. Um, but it is, and we lost anybody who was on the fence at that point. We lost readers. Like we saw yeah. like a dip in our sales after that. But that was fine. It was it was nice, like cleansing of like who's really reading the book. Did that issue make it into the power script book with all the sound effects of the monkeys having sex? And... No, I don't think that was in the script book. But um, but it ultimately also became one of our most popular storylines. When you read that in context together, it is one of the the, the fan favorite books and. One of my favorite storylines for that. But but getting back to like, yeah, so, so Brian and I don't all, often communicate well outside of that. So like we've, we've burned through our editors and colorists, like, you know, drummers and, and you know, um, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty bad. Um, yeah, I left the editing t- all together. <laughs> yeah, so was that like last you edited? <laughs> that was, uh, you, I was editing you and then I was the editor in chief of Morning Press. So it was more like all of it, but it's like, yeah. I'm done. Wow. And it's like all red because he's easy. And I did a little bit for Andy Watson, but since then it was like, ah, no more. Yeah. Big Girl's reminding me of that. I'm like, I'm going to have to wrangle a whole team and keep them together. Yeah. Thank goodness they're like a well oiled machine. That's cool. That's cool. Um, but was, I think after all the years, Brian and I finally have got it back on track. Powers Bureau. Um, we had a big break because of the television series, the television show, um, which went into full um, pilot production. Brian's working on it. It's been working on it like every day and stuff, um, but that definitely threw a, a a wrench into the into the thing. But we came back completely refreshed from that. So I'm like, I think I'm finishing up issue five now. The first two issues are out, and uh, is that gonna be going foreseeably for the future? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Is there a big jump? Because you guys are also we've now done two Tokyo books together. Uh, yeah, we did a graphic novel and then there's a four issue miniseries. Is it how do you jump from? <laughs> the issue of powers was like all the like, homicide and grizzly <laughs> stuff to over to something as fresh and clean as Tokyo. It was I loved it because it was such a nice a break from what I typically do in, in tone and also artistically because it was kind of a generally open line um, art style. It was a lot of fun uh, to do that. So um, and and again that that all came out of that sort of weird relationships that you have with your co-creators. So over the years um, I, I've seen a, a Brian's daughter Olivia from being born to growing up into this young woman and stuff. And uh, my wife, Taki, and, and Olivia uh, hit it off immediately. There was this, this rapport that was that was there even between a, a child and an adult. And Olivia started coming up about years on her own about Takio. And I don't know who had framed Takio, the, the, the coin, the, the, the 
the name of it, but it was basically Olivia's idea to have like her and Taki as, because she's also, in a, 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 both Taki and Olivia come from adopted families where they adopted people and stuff, um, or stepchildren and such. Um, so to her, it was very natural, was, Taki's my sister. And like, uh, she came up with the idea of a uh, Kung Fu telekinesis and all this stuff. Um, so, so working on that was really interesting because there I am drawing one of my best friends <laughs> drawing one of my best, yeah, you're not in the book. <laughs> Sorry. Like, come on. <laughs> but drawing one of my best friend's uh, daughters as a, as a major character and Kelly Sue Dominic's a uh, friend of the family, like uh, drawing her in there as well as a little kid and Taki, my wife, drawing her as a 14 year old and stuff. Like it, it'd be, and I was, it's really hard to explain what that's like, but it was, it was super awesome and uh, makes it a joy. So there's actually definitely two extremes there with you have this personal expression about your family and yourself in Wild Rover and in some ways in the victories and then you've got this other book that's full of family and it's more joyful and do, do you find yourself do you need both sides then as part of your creative expression? No, no. Um, it just worked out that way um, and I don't think something like Takio could have happened without Brian. Um, Brian uh, he's, just, he's a happy dude, you know, I mean, he's, he's got his own, like, frustrations and anxieties, and there's shit that he has to deal with that's not always pleasant and stuff, and, but he, he, he has a way of embracing joy, uh, in a boundless way, and I think that's, that's what really defines Takio, um, uh, because I can never, like, I'm, I don't want to make it sound like I'm this tortured guy, because clearly I'm, I'm not, but I just, I just really acknowledge that's part of who I am, and I have trouble sometimes, having a joyful moment without thinking of how shitty things are or how yeah. quickly it could go from, you know, joyful to bad or, you know, oh, wow, one day Jamie's going to be dead. I don't, you know, like, literally that's in my yeah. back of my mind. It's like, oh, I wonder what his funeral's going to be like. <laughs> I <always> do. Yeah. <laughs> what, what if they just die on the way out of here? Um, and that's where my mindset's at. And I think that's, a lot of that comes from, again, I realized this through therapy was um, when you're young and you have something... Um, sort of unexpectedly, shockingly bad happen to you, you then carry that expectation with the rest of your life of like, um, if you've had the, the sort of psychological rug pulled out from you as a child, you end up bringing that with you everywhere you go. And that's where I think a lot of anxieties come from. And the tool you have then is realizing that, oh, you're just, it's, it's like a bad form of magical thinking. You know, getting on a plane and thinking about how uh, you're gonna die or it's gonna crash or you're going to get food poisoning and be you know, stuck in an airplane with, horrific food poisoning and the shit never happens, but you're always expecting it can because something just as bad did happen to you when you were a kid, you know, and, and you bring that. See, I can't talk about Takio without bringing it into that. Well, when we were talking to Michael Allred, he was talking about how his character, basically Mad Man, is him on a specific journey. Mm -hmm. He's looking for stuff through his stories. Yeah. Do you think there's an element to your work or there's going to be something like that for you to where it becomes I have this large question and I'm going to use this vehicle to answer it and, or get as close to it as possible? Yeah. Um, I think that's what I'm doing now. Um, you know, a lot of what I'm writing about the, these characters are about trying to figure out how to, um, ha you know, how to you know, live with these things and just be happy. You know, um, it's, it's, I realized the kind of the riddle of my life is how do I embrace, um, happiness? Like, how do I allow myself to be happy? Like, I know that, like, that sounds really easy. I mean, Brian told me that once, um, at some point I was after my divorce and he was like, man, you just gotta allow yourself to be happy. And I was like, that's the best advice I've ever had. It makes so much sense, but God, it's just, it's, it's hard, you know? Um, generally I'm happy too, but there is, you know, there's times where it's just hard to, you, you feel like you're fighting it all the time. So it's great to be able to fictionalize that to your work and it does become therapy. Like you can work that shit out and um, I mean, art therapy is a real thing for a reason and I'm just lucky to be able to make money off of it. Yeah, I mean, for some reason when I was really young, I had this whole like, I fought against that you write what you know. This is like a kid. I was like, yeah, you really you make it up. up. You make it up, it's imagination. And yeah. it was in high school where I was going through lots of terrible stuff that mm -hmm. started writing stories that filtered that out. And I feel better. Now. Yeah, and also, well, it takes. I think it takes years for a, a writer or a creative person to really understand what that means. Write what you know. It sounds so easy. It's another thing, like you know, allow yourself to be happy. But write what you know. So I grew up in Jersey with really nothing. Like I didn't even have the coolest Jersey stuff because I lived in like a suburb of Jersey. So it wasn't like North Jersey where there's like a lot of mob around and like cities and bus rides into New York yeah. and adventures and shit like that. Like there was nothing around. We had a set of woods. 
which is awesome for our imagination because it was a blank slate to develop that stuff. But like, I was like, well, what do I know? Like, I just, I didn't do anything but write and draw comic books. And I, I felt like I didn't have uh, things to, to talk about. You, you know? didn't do like music or other team type stuff or? I did, but it was just, there, there wasn't like a scene to go to. Like it was in my room and all that stuff was just in my head. Um, so writing what you know, like it just, it just took growing up, you know, like having a kid and, you know, um, and experiences. And it, it took me a long time to figure out, like, it seems like that's a development itself to figure out what you're writing about is just as hard as actually writing about it, you know? So you, think, you think you'd ever do like straight auto bio or? No, because, um, I'm just not, you mean as far as a comic book? Yeah. I was, I could, I might, but it, it might be re redundant then because I put so much of that into um, stuff like Victories and, and Wild Rover, you know, so it'd be, yeah, I'd be stealing from myself. Um, but the wonderful thing about fictionalizing it is it's not all, like, all of, like, Faustus's issues are not mine. Yes. You know, um, a lot of times they'll start out with mine and then they'll just go into another direction or they'll start out with friends or families who I'll design characters after. Um, that's just the first step and then, you know, it becomes something else. And you also have the ability to rewrite when you're writing yeah. about your own life, but you're not writing it as your own life. It's like, I can make, I can actually do it right this time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or usually I end up making it worse. <laughs> it's like, I don't want like the real consequence of yeah. this. Yeah. Well, that's the thing with like, when, you know, if, if people think I'm going overboard on stuff like victories and stuff, like these issues, whether it's, you know, you're talking about like child molestation or alcoholism or depression or violence, way worse than anything you could really put in a comic. So like, to me, like it, it still feels way toned down. Um, in fact, uh, Victory's, uh, originally the main character, not the main character, the main villain, Jackal, um, uh, Jackal was, um, how do I put it? He was just going to have his penis was hanging out. Like, right now he's got this metal yeah, cotton piece. Uh, so, with spikes on it. Yeah, so originally he was just going to be kind of naked. And, like, the idea, again, was that physical threat. Like, physically he's supposed to be repulsive and he's supposed to be scary. And like the, the old Celtic warriors used to do, like there's nothing scarier than a guy attacking you is naked and stuff. Because whether it's uh, you know um, a straightforward like erect uh, penis or not, it's still this this threat of of rape. And whether you're a male or female, that's a scary that's a scary thing, and it's a it's another level to put onto the character. Um, and he's got his tongue hanging out. That's also very phallic. Yeah. yeah, I've discovered my work is very phallic. Uh, my wife has pointed that out. Like sometimes. She'll just look at a page and go, penis, 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 penis. <laughs> what? Oh, okay. Um, but we decided not to go with that, not because of a real, it, it was sort of a censoring thing, but not not really. Um, Scott Alley, our editor, he was he was like, all right, we can do this if you want, but um, we'll probably have to bag it because of the issues that will be associated with that. I was like, well, I hate bad comics, so, um, so then I, I spent the day editing penises. Well, penis <laughs> editor, right here. <laughs> On that note, you made me go upstairs and look at the process of how you you, you bring these things to life. <laughs> Speaking of penises, let's yes. go upstairs to talk yeah, about my process. Let's see your introduction. <laughs> um, so yeah, set up your studio. All right, cool. Let's do that.